Writers, there is a new writing niche that makes it easy to increase your writing income with short, simple projects. You've likely never heard of it because even though it's been around for a while, nobody ever talks about it. Yet right now, the demand for writers is blowing up. It's going to launch thousands of new writing careers. So stay tuned as we're about to talk to the top expert in this niche. You'll learn what it is, how to break in, and how to use it to grow your writing income fast. Let's go. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Matter here. I am very excited to finally bring you to today's training. Have you ever heard of battle cards? Or how about one sheets? I know Pam Foster, who will be in the Q&A, has heard of them, as has my special guest. Do not worry if you haven't. These are just two of more than a dozen fast writing projects that pay $1,000 and up in an all-new writing niche that I just learned about earlier this summer. So yes, you heard that right. Just when you think there can't be any more new opportunities for writers, another massive one comes along. We are talking about a whole new genre of copywriting here. My special guest today calls it sales enablement copywriting, but it's a bit of a misnomer because there's no actual selling going on in the copy. You're merely making sure that the people who do the selling have all the information that they need. So we're going to dig into this in just a minute, but the important takeaway that I want you to grasp from today's workshop is that this is an opportunity to get in on the ground floor of something that will launch thousands of new writing careers. Getting in, mean, getting in now, it means your choice of top end clients who are going to pay $2,000, $3,000. We're going to talk about this, even as high as $5,000 on a regular basis, depending on the size of the company. And because the demand for this form of copywriting is growing so fast, by companies in one of the highest paying niches in the world, there's never been just a better opportunity to step in immediately and start earning real money as a writer with just a few long-term clients right now. So with the situation this big and this new and this exciting and with so much potential for you as a writer, I want to make sure that we get it right, right from the start and get you the information that you need today to take full advantage. Hence, our special guest who's here to tell you about it. So really quick, let me introduce him. For over 30 years, he's been a master level B2B writer. And in case you're not familiar with the term B2B, it stands for business to business, which basically means that our guest has spent decades writing marketing materials for companies that sell their products and services to other companies that need them. As a result, he's worked for some of the biggest names in the B2B world, companies that you probably are familiar with, like UPS, Hewlett Packard, Sprint, and Forbes. He's won numerous awards in multiple countries for his work including ABI's own Copywriter of the Year Award in 2016. And as a sought-after speaker and teacher, his how-to books for business writers are, of course, top sellers on Amazon. More importantly for you, though, is that this guy is one of the best copywriting teachers around, my personal favorite. He's mentored, I shouldn't say that, right, with our faculty, one of my personal favorites. He's mentored hundreds of writers to more successful and profitable writing careers, and yet, despite all of this success and all of this experience writing for B2B clients, he just made the biggest pivot in his 30-year writing career, choosing to focus most of his writing on this emerging copywriting need. That's how great this opportunity is. So with that, and here to tell you all about it, I give you Steve Swanway. Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you doing? Welcome today. and Thank you so much for taking the time out. I, at the very beginning, I was talking before we started recording, earlier this summer, you and I sat down and had a conversation, That's and right. we were just catching up and talking about what we were working on, and you were like, oh, before you go, let me tell you a story, and you told me about this thing, and I started vibrating, started getting exciting, started <laughs> IMing all of our teams, saying, we have to know about this, this is huge, it's called sales enablement copywriting, which doesn't sound super sexy, but it's so big. Can you start at the very, very beginning? What exactly is sales enablement copywriting? Well, to understand uh, sales enablement copywriting, you need to understand what sales enablement is. Okay. And sales enablement uh, is all about equipping a sales team at a company with everything they need to sell more products and services. So that can include sales training. That can include CRM. But increasingly, it also includes content, content for uh, sales emails, content for sell sheets and one sheets. We're going to talk about more, more about those in a bit. But content is becoming a growing part of that. So sales enablement 
content is all about uh, giving the sales team the content they need to sell more. And let's, let me give you just one quick example just yeah. to clarify this. Sales teams, they do a lot of, uh, they do a lot, they work with a lot of email. They, they, they engage with prospects. They reach out to prospects. They sell a lot with email, but they're not writers. So they use a lot of email templates that they use and adapt that are well written, use and adapt that they can use when they sell. That's a tool that they use, these sales email templates. So that is a type of content they use. And of course, the better the templates, the better the sales emails, the more successful they'll be and the more they'll, the more products and services they'll sell. So uh, that's uh, just one of many examples of the content you write as a sales enablement copywriter. And you said that the sales team doesn't do this writing because that's not their forte. They don't like to write. What is, why don't they do more of it? Why don't they write more of this stuff? Yeah. Why, why don't, why don't salespeople write their own stuff? Some of them do, but traditionally salespeople are not very good writers. Uh, a lot of them don't want to write. They, they want to sell, right? They want to sell. They don't want to say, okay, I, I got to send an email to a prospect that I'm working on. What am I going to say in the email? Uh, how should I start it? What, what should the subject line be? And they don't want to think all that through. They don't know the best practices of persuasive copywriting. They're, they're salespeople. So they just want to use a template that they know is, that they know is going to work. They know follows the best practices of a sales email, adapt it, and then send it out. So they can get on to the next call. Right? And that Helps as someone who used to, used to manage sales teams long ago, my sales reps wanted to be on the phone. They did not want to file paperwork or do anything that wasn't on the phone, closing the sale. But I find it interesting that like you said, well, they don't want to think like, how do I start the email? How do I do the thing? For us writers, we're like, let us do that part. We can do that easy. That's not anything that we even have to sweat about because we're writers. Right. That makes it easier for us. Well, that's us. Yeah, that's what we do. And that's what yeah, we love to do. To we, we, like, we like to write. Salespeople like to sell but they've been forced uh, into having to write and they don't really want to do it and they're not good at it. So sales directors, their bosses are saying, hey, let's give them the, let's, let's, let's get a good copywriter, give them the content that they need so they can sell more. And that's, so, that's where the growth is in sales enablement copywriting. So if sales enablement has been around then for a while, it's just this new demand that sounds like it's booming and growing, which is creating kind of this, this, That's this right. need. A good, so a good analogy, a good analogy, Rebecca, is content marketing has been around for decades. Like right. Benjamin Franklin used content <laughs> marketing to promote his printing business. But what happened 10, 15 years ago, it exploded in demand yeah. and every yep. company was investing in content marketing and it, they needed all these writers. That's what's happening right now with sales enablement. Sales enablement has been around uh, before the words, the term sales enablement was invented. So, but, you know, we've, you know, we've sales teams always use call scripts and, and tools and things like that. But the last two or three years, it's exploded. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a hundredfold. So is it safe to say then that it's becoming a buzzword or a thing now within sales organizations? Like if I'm running a sales team, do I know now that this is a thing that writers exist, that if I had this thing, my job would be better and I could sell more? Is that connection being made now in the industry? Here's where the connection is being made. In fact, there's a survey by Learn.G2 did a survey of sales executives and 84% cited content as a way to uh, help their sales team become more productive and sell more. Wow. Better content is what they say. 84% said that on a survey. Which so sales leaders, people who manage the sales teams, sales VPs, sales directors, sales managers, uh, they're very aware they need better content. They need better uh, templates for emails, for prospecting emails, for follow-up emails. They need better uh, sales decks. They need better battle cards, uh, call scripts. They need all this stuff to help their sales team. They know they need better content. So they're very aware of that. Um, where they're struggling is that there's, who's going to write this stuff? <laughs> who, who, knows how to, who knows the best practices? Who knows how to write a prospect and email template? Who knows how to write an effective battle card? Who knows how to write an effective call script for their sales team? Who can do this for us? 
That's where they're struggling. And that's a big difference. So everyone listening in, when you heard the word content, our brains immediately flipped to blogs and articles and podcasts and things like that. So we're going to get into the specifics. I actually want to show you some examples because this was a big eye opener for me too. And one of what I feel are the big benefits, but not yet, not yet, Ben. It's one of the big benefits about this opportunity because of the style of projects we're writing. We're going to get into the specifics about that in a minute, but I'm guessing if everybody knows about this thing and we need more content, I'm guessing the sales leaders know that this would help my sales team, but you'd be better, which means the sales reps probably know this would help them be better, which I'm guessing is what's also driving demand. Now you have sales reps hearing other companies are using these materials. I'm now at a disadvantage. I could sell more for you, director, if I had the materials too. So it just seems like everybody's now asking for this stuff. You, you, you hit the nail on head. That is exactly it. As sales teams, like sales professionals, are saying, you know, I, I need better tools here. Yeah. I need better tools. You know, and they consider uh, what a copywriter can do for them as 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 a, a tool. You know, give give me the sales, give me the sales email templates, give me the battle cards, give me the sales guys, give me the call scripts, give me these tools, the one sheets that I can I can use to sell more. So they're they're demanding that, Love and at it. the same time, VP of sales are also saying, yes, yeah, yeah, we definitely want to give you better tools because the whole idea of sales enablement is that the better the tools I give our, my sales team, the more they'll sell. They'll and sell it makes more. total sense. And what I love about this opportunity is instead of us as writers having to walk in and say, I can do this for you and here's how it's going to benefit your business. They have people on the inside saying, director, manager, we need this stuff. Go out and find us this stuff. And now you've got a bunch of, it's like the demand, the, the, the conversation has flipped a little bit from us going and selling what we do and why we're valuable to them saying, I need this, who can do this for me, for my sales team so I can give them what they want, which right. is, I love that. That's, You're that's huge. Right. Can you give us an example just so we can get in like the, to really understand what's happening in there. An example, let's say of how. Mar First of all, marketing and sales, that whole piece of it, that this is on the sales side, not the marketing side. So can you touch a little bit on the marketing side and then talk about how if those two things are not aligned, how this really does solve that challenge as well. Marketing is doing this and the sales team is doing that. Yeah. Now, now traditionally, um, what marketing is all about is generating leads, right? Brand awareness, uh, campaigns generating leads, and then they would give those leads to the sales team. Right. And, and in the past, they give the leads to the sales team. The sales team would run with it and that would be the end of it. But now, now this is what, what's happening is that, uh, what sales is saying is that, okay, you're giving us these leads, but we still need great copy, great copy and content for our, our emails, our battle cards, our one sheets to help take these leads and turn them into sales. You know, so the copywriting work isn't over yet. That's what sales is saying. You know, you guys in marketing have these great copywriters, but it's not over yet. We need a copywriter over on our side to help us create all these materials to help our sales team sell, right? That's so interesting. That, There's a little bit of a conflict there because I'm the marketer. I'm like, hey, I'm doing my job. I handed you a bunch of leads. It's your job to sell them. I need to go generate more leads. And right. they kind of leave the sales reps abandoned almost. Like, okay. Well, that's now, the, that, that was the way it was done years ago. I mean, uh, and not that many years ago where we just relied on, a, a salesperson to just be able to do it. And you hire a salesperson, they'd either be able to sell or they're not able to sell. And that was it. And the idea of equipping them with, with tools that they could use to sell more, that really didn't become very popular until just a few years ago. Now companies are investing heavily into it. So just uh, to pull out of this conversation for a minute, uh, team, and me talk to my ADBI members, you know, we talk a lot about and copy about empathy, about knowing where our prospect is. The reason I want to dig in that moment and the takeaway I want from that first section of this interview is empathy for who you're writing for. When you are reaching out to these companies, not only are they right now wanting you, their sales reps, you're going to talk to the director of sales, their sales reps are saying, get us this stuff. We need this stuff. We can sell more if you could just find this stuff. That sales director, putting yourself in his shoes, he's trying to help his sales team. Everybody benefits. The company benefits. The sales director benefits. The sales team benefits. The sales director looks like a winner to his boss and to the team that he's leading because he gets to bring this stuff. So when you get, when we talk about getting clients later and we talk about that, understanding the empathy of where, or having empathy for where that person stands right now 
they are in this interesting position where they're trying to do their job. And now they've been given a new set of demands that can make their job even better. So they want to fulfill this demand. So for you walking in, you're really coming in as the the rainmaker, the solution provider, the person with the wand who can say, here you go. I got, I have what you need. And that's, that's just a really exciting position to be in. So I'd like to pivot. I want to talk about the types of projects, but first I'm sure we have a lot of uh, members on writers who are kind of newer to this. Is this, is there a barrier to entry for newer writers? Is this good for newer writers? What am I thinking if I'm brand new and this is my first encounter with B2B or even with sales enablement, is this something that I can get into? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you had 10 years experience writing sales letters and sales pages, I mean, that's going to help this writing experience. But you don't need it. Um, you know, what you need to know is you need to know the type of projects that uh, sales directors need written. Uh, you need to know the best practices and formulas and formats to write those projects. Okay. And, uh, you know, that, that's about it. What, what, once you learn how, how to write these effectively, then uh, you're most of the way there to uh, working with companies as a sales enablement copywriter. So this, this it's, it's learnable, I guess. You I say. like, okay, so it's learnable. And I love, you said the word formulas, because for me as a newbie, you know, a sales letter how long? What's the idea? It's all over the place as far as what it could be. Oftentimes people ask me, you know, how long should the sales letter be? And Nick Usborne told me a long time ago, that's like asking me, how long is a piece of string? I don't know. Like, it's just going right. to kind of, we'll figure it out once we get there. But with this, there is a real formulaic process to it, right? There, I'm, I'm yeah. delivering an exact thing that the salesperson is expecting. It's interesting. It very, it, it is exacting. Um, I mean, you do know how long a piece of string is. <laughs> if you have a string once project. it's done, yes. Yeah. You know how long the emails need to be. You know how, how detailed a battle card needs to be, uh, call scripts and things like that. Um, you, you have a good idea of, of what they're going to look like in advance. So, and also there is uh, best practices and formulas for writing all of it. You know, the call scripts, the uh, sales emails and that. Uh, I, I've worked out in my time doing this, all the, all the formulas and, and, and techniques. I kind of broke them down in the formulas so I can write them better, right? I love it. So you so, can fire uh, off, you know, exactly how long it's going to take you and you can do these things faster for clients. That's right. That's right. You know, and, you know, if you add your own uh, writing talents and creativity within that formula and within those best practices, all the better. That's, that's great. Well, let's actually look at a couple of examples because we've been teasing like battle cards and things like that. So Ben, go ahead and put up the slide about the, that shows what a battle card is. Steve, can you tell us what is a battle card? And I know that it's a little bit longer than this, but just walk us through what this project, this specific project might look like. One example sure. of sales enablement. Sure. Well, a battle card uh, can, can be anywhere from uh, two to five pages long, usually right. around three pages, four pages in length, not longer than that. And uh, the battle card can include a lot of different information, traditionally included uh, responses to competitor objections. So a salesperson is talking to a prospect or emailing a prospect, and the prospect says, I can get this cheaper from your competitor. And then the salesperson, what do I say now? <laughs> you know, how yeah. do I respond to that? Well, a battle card will include a couple of ways to respond to it written in a very conversational language of how to respond to that. And by the way, there's a formula for how to write that response, okay, that I've worked out. So it includes that type of stuff. It includes lists of features and benefits that a salesperson can pull from, whether they're talking to a client or emailing a client or communicating in some other way. Uh, they they want to hit on some features and benefits. You've already written them out in a very persuasive way. They can pull from that. An elevator pitch description of the product, uh, answers to common questions about the product. So that's all part of a battle card. I love the name battle card. Like even what it implies, like I'm going to battle to win this sale and I've got everything I need. That's right. Help it, originally, it was just, originally a battle card was, was just to compete with competitors. So you're doing battle with competitors. But battle cards have evolved to, con to contain a lot of other information as well. I love it. And it does look like it's pretty formulaic in that this is what I'm giving. I'm arming the sales rep with this information so they know exactly how to overcome this thing, how to compete with their competitors. That, that's right. That's right. 
Yeah. So, awesome. and it's a tool. You can see how a salesperson can refer to this again and again when they're communicating with their prospects. Excellent. All right, Ben, let's go up to the one sheet then. So what is a one sheet and how does that differ from a battle card? How is this used? Yeah, a, a one sheet is um, one thing unique about sales enablement stuff is that it's a lot of it's not publicly produced. It's just produced for the sales team. They use it. They don't show it to prospects. A one sheet is something that they can they show to their prospects. Uh, so, and uh, very broad definition. A one sheet could be a one or two page brochure, a one sheet brochure like a sell sheet. It could be a reference sheet on how a particular product uh, works within a particular application. So we have this product. How does it work in the food and beverage industry? Here's a one sheet on how this product, Mr. Prospect, is going to work in the food and beverage industry. And of course, you'll have features and benefits and how it works in the food and beverage industry. It could be a one sheet. So one sheet is a broad term that can include a lot of different types of information. Very popular with salespeople. So I guess the different battle card is for the sales reps to be armed. One sheet is to actually send one sheet. They, the, yeah, the they take the one sheet. It's in PDF format. They'll send it to the prospect. They'll send an email and say, oh, by the way, you wanted, you wanted to know on our last conversation, Mr. Prospect, how our product really works well in the food and beverage industry. Here's a one sheet on how it works in the food and beverage industry. Awesome. And, okay. and they send that along. So we've talked about battle cards, talked about one sheets. Those are newer project types. Let's talk about email for a second, because I know that's one of your sweet spots in this industry, right? The, the writing emails for B2B clients for sales enablement. Yes, it's, it's, it's almost half the work I do. And if you get into sales enablement copywriting, it's going to be a good third to half the work you do is writing uh, emails for, for the sales team to use and adapt. That's what they really love. That's the number one tool they're looking for. Give me, give me some better emails to use. They're just hungry for that. What I love about that too is I'm going to loop back to something you said earlier about if you know the formulas and you can write, that's part of it. And then if you can add your own style, your personality to make these, and I'm guessing email is very, that's very relevant there because email is a one-to-one -one communication. It's a human yes. form of communication as opposed to maybe a brochure that feels a little bit more like it's made for everyone. I'm guessing this is where you get to put in a little bit of your, your style and how you write and communicate. You're absolutely right. Cause these are one-to-one. -one. These are not marketing emails that's sent to a list of thousands. These are what salespeople use to send an email to one prospect. So there's a formula and they're modifying it to that prospect. Yeah. This you give, you give them a template and they'll and they'll modify it as they will. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they use it as is. Uh, and sometimes they'll make a couple of changes because of something they know about the prospect. So there's an area, particularly at the beginning, where they may customize it a little bit. Well, let's look at a couple of examples. But I'm guessing how how what are, what are the types of fees for emails? And you said it's a it's a good third part of your writing time is writing email. Yeah, these are very lucrative. Uh, usually you don't get hired to write one email template. You, you get you get hired to write like a package of 10 or 20. Uh, a package of 10, you could charge anywhere from at the low end $2,000 to maybe $3,000, $3,500. And these are short that they're usually no more than 75 to 150 words. So That's, okay, guys, yeah. everybody pause for a second. <laughs> 75 words to 100 words. That's anywhere between 200 and 350 for an email, but it's a package. So you're making just by sitting down 2000 to 3,500. And that's just one project type. I love this. So Steve, I want to, we put together this little example and I know you said you can't see the screen. So I'm going to read it for them. Thank and you. guys, I want you guys to pay attention and decide which one you think is stronger. So this is email a, so this is a sales rep is sending this to somebody that they're hoping to close on a sale. Jill, I know you're busy. This will only take a minute and could help you cut costs. With insurance fees for warehousing operations going through the roof, leaders in e-commerce distribution are under enormous pressure to make cuts. Our new line of forklift trucks with COB technology are so safe that distribution facilities can often negotiate better insurance rates. To reserve a private, customized online demo, use this Calendly link to schedule or reply to this email with three desired dates and times. Lower insurance rate for your facilities are waiting for your response. Don't wait. Let's talk soon. That's email A. Now let's look at email B. And you guys are going to decide which one's stronger and write it in the Q&A. You're going to do A or B. So this is email B. 
Hi, Jill. I just read your promotion to VP Logistics. Congratulations. If you're like many new leaders in e-commerce distribution, you're feeling the pressure to reduce insurance costs. Did you know that safer forklifts can help? In fact, our new line of forklifts featuring our groundbreaking COB safety system is cutting insurance costs for our clients 12 to 18 percent. Would you be interested in finding out if you can get similar savings? If so, here's a suggestion. Let's hop on a quick Zoom call where you can ask questions and get the answers you need. Looking at my calendar, I have Thursday at 2.15, Friday at 8.45 a.m. free, or use my calendar link and then the signature. So everybody decide A or B and post that in the Q&A. And then Steve will reveal the winner. And then I want you to talk through why the winner was the winner. And any just kind of insights for how you might write the better one. How can you improve emails that seem template to make them feel a little bit more personal? Okay. Right, right, done. We'll give you 10, <clears throat> 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Put it in the Q&A. Okay. And the winner is... Did you go, Ben? Flip the slide. <laughs> it's B. <laughs> so Steve, why is B the better choice of the two? Yeah, it's it, this is an interesting comparison, isn't it? Because the first email is pretty good too, right? Like, why would the first email not work and the second email works so well? And the reason is that you've got to write these emails differently than you write marketing emails. So there's certain uh, components of this email that make it work well for a salesperson using it and adapting it. Notice that the first line is really a customization. I just read about your promotion to VP Logistics. Well, that's only applicable to one prospect, right? So you customize that first line. What I often, I, I give clients a list of 12 ways that they can, that a sales team can customize the first line. And, uh, and, and they, they give them to their sales team to use. And I'm happy to, re, to, uh, to share that, by the way. Um, so customize the first line. Go down a little bit. There's another component there. Notice that sentence. Would you be interested in finding out if you can get similar savings. That is a uh, what's called an interest building question. And what I found with sales email templates is that if you put an interest building question just before your call to action, it boosts reply rates. More prospects will reply back to your email. Okay, because wow. it's interesting, would you be interested in? And so then give them a very simple ask. Would you be interested in finding out if you can get similar savings? This well, is why I love working with yeah. Steve because Steve gives us things all the time. It's like little breadcrumbs all the way through your presentations that we can take away. So just like the empathy with the sales manager before, this is another breadcrumb that you can take away beyond this presentation. He just talked about an interest building question before your call to action. When else do we as writers write emails like this? When we're reaching out to prospective clients. So I'm guessing you could try that exact same idea in your own correspondence with prospective clients. Again, asking them a question, and I'm guessing, Steve, it will generate a better response than if you're just talking to them. You're absolutely right. And by the way, if you send them an email like this, you're also sending them a portfolio sample. You're sending them an example of, you know, of how you write a, a cold outreach email, right, which you're going to be very interested in. Guys, you know? like already, this is right. Just, just yay. Yeah. <laughs> in your conversations with prospects, you can say, uh, did you notice that second last sentence? Here's what it does. Here's what it's for. It's proven to boost response. Can you imagine how how impressed a prospect will be when they hear that? They'll really, really get that you understand how to put one of these emails together. Love it so much. So before we move on from project types, can you just fire off quickly maybe a couple of other? We've talked about battle cards, one sheets, and emails. What are some of the other types of content that you write for sales enablement? Yeah, battle cards, one sheets, emails galore. This, these are prospecting emails, but also follow up emails at different points in the sales journey. Oh, right. You know, emails like model emails after you send a proposal or quotation in to follow up. You know, so there's lots of different emails that, that you write. Uh, we mentioned one sheets, call scripts. You might be surprised with call scripts. Obviously, uh, uh, B2B sales teams don't read off a canned script when they do a call. <laughs> but sometimes they. Here. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes in order to stay on track, they like to use a call script that has the opening scripted, the close scripted, some key messages scripted that they can follow. In fact, uh, they're sometimes called call tracks rather than call scripts for that reason. But, uh, you know, there are best practices on how to write those. They're a lot of fun to write, actually. Uh, so that's a that's a popular project. Uh, so th those are all the traditional sales enablement projects. 
Uh, proposals is another one. I mean, people send a proposal. So sales decks. A sales deck is, is a sales series deck? of slides okay. that a salesperson will pull from to put together a customized presentation for a prospect. That's a, a sales deck. So it's like having a library of slides you could include that are all designed and ready to go. And then they just say, I want this one, this one. We, we talked right. about this problem, so I'm going to pull that. Wow. So it looks like they put together a custom presentation specifically for their person, but really they were able to do it quickly because it came from this master deck. That's right. Uh, again, given the sales team tools they can use yeah. to be more productive and sell more. So just pull the slides out, put it together. they got a customized presentation. Uh, sales decks are fun projects to write, and you don't have to design the slides. Clients are interested in the content, what okay. you put on the slides, text on the slides. I love this. Okay, so actually, can we take one step back now? We kind of understand what's happening. We understand marketing's purpose. We understand sales purpose. We understand some of the project types. Can you kind of walk us through for those of us who are brand new to a selling process? Because B2B, it's such a long process with so many touches. Could you maybe walk us through a scenario of salesperson gets the lead, then what happens? I'm selling a bunch of forklifts. What happens in that process? Yeah, there's there's basically in a traditional B2B selling process, there's basically three steps. And you can almost think it as a, as a if you think of a baseball diamond, okay, the first base is discovery. That's where you're at that stage with the prospect where they're discovering about your solution, your product, and how it might work. So sales emails at that stage, one sheets at that stage. And then you get the second base. Second base is evaluation. You got the prospect interested. Now at the, that stage in the process, which could be weeks down the road, that stage in the process, the prospect is interested enough to be evaluated. So you're looking at maybe sales decks. Uh, an explainer video script, more emails, always emails, okay? <laughs> battle card, definitely battle cards at that stage. And then the third stage is proposal, base, uh, third base is proposal. And that's when the prospect is well, uh, willing to hear uh, a pitch for a price. And there's whole part of sales enablement copywriting called pitch writing, where you're writing sales decks, where you're writing the proposal. And of course, more emails, <laughs> and that's the third base stuff. And case studies as well. Customer success stories plays a big role on third base. And then home plate, of course, is the sale, right? So you're writing for those that, that buying journey that is so common. I love that. We talk a lot about the customer journey or the buyer's journey in ADBI when we talk about the copy content continuum, all the things that could. What I love about this is it's it's kind of zooming in to one specific use of copy and content and then talking about this specific activity. And that guys is another, just when you think about the opportunity, it's like all the stuff and then you can kind of zoom in. But even when you zoom in, it's still all the stuff. I love what, so it's discovery, interest, proposal, and sale. And I love how it's kind of broken out. Am I talking, even this is a big takeaway, right? If I'm talking to a B2B person and someone's asking me to write copy for them, I can come back and say, are we writing for the discovery stage or are these people already interested? Are they, have they already talked to your sales reps and now they are showing interest? Are we at the proposal phase? I love how you give when you teach concepts like that, because I just from that baseball diamond, I now again can empathize with the sales rep. And I do understand, even though I've never been in a sales team, I understand what their intention is with who they're talking to and where my copy is helping them move them around that baseball diamond. I, that's something that it's a unique to the way that you teach that I really value. And even in this moment, guys, take that away, take that baseball diamond away, because that's, that helps us understand how copy is being used. And the fact that email is being used all the way around the baseball diamond. I love yeah, and so and not only that, but if you talk to a prospect, let's say you're talking to a sales director about your sales enablement, copywriting services, and you say, hey, where do you need the most help? At the discovery stage, the evaluation, the proposal? They're going to know exactly what you mean. Okay, That's I'm the language they understand. I'm going to send my notes to you guys after, but I hope you guys are writing this down. Because again, that's just such a great level. It kind of gives you a little bit of confidence when talking to sales reps that you kind of can have a conversation on a level playing field, even when you're just starting out. So thank you for that, that tip, Steve. So let's talk about money. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about email. Give us some ideas 
of what, you know, the battle cards, the one sheets, what are some of the fees? And, and again, how long those things take to write? Sure, sure. Uh, and just one caveat, it's pretty rare to get a gig for just a package of emails or for one battle card. Usually your first time with a client, they're giving you a lot of materials to write. Okay. It's more of a package. So it's, it's not unusual to get a, like a three, four, five thousand dollar gig right out of the gate because they want you to write a lot of different things as a package. Which right. makes sense. Why would I, as a sales director, want to go hire seven writers to write seven different things when I can hire one writer who's doing the research to do the whole thing, have one continued conversation that's seamless. You understand our products. You understand the features and benefits now. You may as well write everything. Oh, listen, they're not going to hire anybody else. If they like your work, <laughs> they're not going to look at anybody else. Because they've got selling to do. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, they don't. It's not like a direct response company where they may test other writers. That this doesn't happen. They like to be, they found a writer they like. They, they want to keep them happy, right? Okay. But individually, I, I mentioned the, uh, the, the emails, but uh, sales decks, for example, where you're not designing the slides, you're just writing the text for them. Uh, that could be anywhere from about two thousand to thirty five hundred dollars for maybe twenty slides, twenty five slides. Uh, usually, the package is more like thirty, forty, fifty slides because it's a library of slides. Remember, okay. and that could take you maybe a day or two. That's about write. how long it takes me to do a slide deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A uh, battle card you can get a battle card done in a day, and that's a minimum thousand dollars, if not two thousand dollars. Now, there's a step you do have to to interview the sales director, and you may also have to interview one of their salespeople on the team to uh, to get the information that you need. That's part of the process of writing sales enablement copy. So you but do I'm that interview. That interview is you do that interview, and then it applies to all the pieces that you're writing. It's not like well, that's every it. Time. Yeah, you'll, you'll like do that, the interviews, yeah. and then you leverage those among amongst a different a lot of different types of projects. That's why when a client hires you, they tend to hire you for a, a package of of sales enablement materials. They don't want to do seven interviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they don't want to, you know, they don't want three months later, okay, I have to interview you again, no. So they want you to interview them. And, and I use a questionnaire that I've already prepared. So I know I know what questions I need to ask in that interview. So I don't miss any. So I, I have my own sales enablement tools. One of them is the questionnaire, right? Um, yeah, so battle cards, sales decks, we talked about emails already. Emails are... Uh, of, of the different types of projects, by far, I think the most profitable, because once you get this, this into the swing of it, you can write them fairly quickly. And they're amazing to your client. Your clients go, wow, this is fantastic. I, these are perfect. They work. I love them. Yeah. Right. Um, but when you get into the swing of it, you can write them fairly quickly. So they can be very profitable for you. I love what I do at ADBI, but it's going to be hard for me not, like, I just, I'm right here. I'm like, I want this. <laughs> I want to do this because it just, I love the idea of learning something by interviewing the sales director and the salesperson, because now I'm intaking, which puts me in such a great position. I don't have to present to you and create a big idea and come up with all the stuff. I get to pull it from you. You want me to do this. You've asked for me. This is what you're looking for me to provide. So you're leaning in and giving me all the information that you possibly can, because knowing I'm going to spin it into gold for you, I get to just be in the passive authority state of like, let me just take the information from you. That's all I'm looking for right now. I'm like in the doctor role, give me all the information so I can make a prescription. And then to be able to then just go and write and repurpose that one action into various pieces of copy and content. That's very appealing. <laughs> yeah, there's right not there. a whole lot of research involved. You may look at the product information on their website, you know, and things like maybe some previous brochures to familiarize yourself with the product and services. But a lot of the information you want for the sales and enablement materials you're writing, you get from interviewing. You get from interviewing your client is usually the, the uh, sales VP, sales director, and usually an, another interview of maybe one of their better uh, salespeople on the team. Is anyone else like feeling super buzzy right now? Like I saw Elizabeth saying, I want this too, Rebecca. <laughs> you and me, Elizabeth, we're jumping into this. And even that has a formula, like you said. So even that interview process, you formulate, you, you've written a formula for to make sure that you get the right information so that you're not like, oh, shoot, I have to go back to them again. I didn't get enough that I need for the stuff I'm writing. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want that. You want to know what questions to ask. Okay. 
come back down. So <laughs> now I, I'm excited. I'm just putting myself in the shoes of ADBI members and writers. I'm actually literally in my own shoes as a writer, kind of wanting this now. What is it like to get clients? What does that process look like? How will I go into the world? How do I identify clients? How do I reach out? How hard is that going to be? What is that process going to look like for me as a writer? Well, first of all, it, the clients are easy to find because it's, it's any company that has a product that requires a considered buying decision. So a okay. longer sales process and that has a sales team. You know, just, you know, it's so it's easy to find these companies. They have a sales team. Right. Google, Google um, company sales director. You can find the sales director who oversees a team. That's your person. Got it. Yeah. So, so finding who you have to talk to and picking the kind of companies to approach it. That's, that's easy peasy stuff. Much more easy than, than, uh, writing market, their traditional marketing materials. Uh, because if they have a sales team, they need sales enablement content, period. Yeah. Um, and that means, and f- types of companies, a lot, probably 80% of your clients will be business to business in some way. But you may get clients on the B2C side that have, you know, uh, products that require a considered buying decision, insurance, for example, real estate. I have a real estate client who I, I write a lot of sales enablement content for. Um, even high end travel, you know, these $20,000 packages, they have sales yeah. teams, you know, so companies with sales teams okay. uh, is, is your target market. Do you, as a writer, do you niche within the niche? Like, so would I potentially go after sales teams in a similar industry within B2B or would I jump around from competitive reasons? Do you focus on project type? How does that? Well, your project type is sales enablement. So if if you want to be the battle card copywriter, don't do that. You won't get anywhere. Your specialty is sales enablement. You got to be able to write all the sales enablement stuff. Okay. Uh, As far as picking a particular industry, Right now, because it's so ground floor, it's not really necessary. I mean, you don't have any, there's not a lot of competitors. So it's not really necessary to meet you. So you can write for any company. And, uh, and again, because the sales rep, the director's, because you said the director is giving you everything. So if I don't know anything about prosthetics and then tomorrow I'm writing about forklifts, it doesn't really matter because I'm asking the sales director all the information that I need to give them back what they need about this product or service. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite questions is, what what do you say to a prospect when they say your price is too high? And they'll they'll say, well, I always say this to a prospect. And then I sometimes use their words, <laughs> you know, Perfect. I kind of sell their words back to them. I, I make the words better, but that ends up on the battle card, right? Because that's frontline best practices. So you're, 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 when you're doing these interviews, you're finding out what works, right? What are they doing that's working? And then what are they doing that's not working? That's actually a tip, guys, for everything that you do. If you're talking, even in the creative, the copy, the content side, you're talking to the product champion, you're talking to the veterinarian, you're talking to the creative director, and they're giving you, oftentimes they talk in the form of copy just because they know what they're doing. They know what their pain points are of their prospects, and they're giving you all that information. So take Steve's tip right there, record those conversations. Oftentimes you'll just be handing them back their words written in copy form in a much right, nicer, right. easier to absorb. Well, that's so it. Yeah, absolutely. I want to open this up because I want to know what questions you guys have out there. So get ready for the Q, for a Q&A part. This is awesome. There's so, I don't even know what I'm most excited about because there's so many pieces of it. I love the fact that it's ground floor. We both know that ground floor, anything. So people who enter any ground floor are going to be the people who benefit the most, which is always very exciting to me. And I'm guessing that's why you jumped into this space as well yeah yeah first in line yeah absolutely line. You know, yeah. If there's a ground floor opportunity they don't come up very often in the copywriting world like like i said the last one i think was probably seo copywriting where yeah. 15 20 years ago no one heard about it and people like heather lloyd martin yep. jumped into it and she's a superstar today right so pioneer because she in. planted her flag she was one of the first people to say i'm going to specialize in seo copy and everyone's like what the heck is who specializes in that I do, because <laughs> I get to plant the flag. <laughs> That's I, I love that. I love the fact that there's a quick intake for us introvert writer types. I like the fact that I land a client and they give me a whole package of assignments. I like the fact that it's one intake call with a director and a sales rep to get all the information that I need. And then I just get to go back into my writing corner back there and actually do the work. I like the fees. I like the package. There's a lot here 
I wanted to ask you quickly just about the certification. So you have put together a certification for us. We'll be the first to certify in sales enablement copywriting. I know that you teach your uh, formulas. So you created your formulas for how you write all these projects. You're going to teach how to write all the projects with the formulas. You talked about the intake. I'm guessing you teach that part as well, how to actually pull the information that you need from the clients. Yeah. And, and actually the, the, uh, the program includes the questionnaire that I use. Okay. And then as far as uh, getting clients and reaching out, do you have any part of the training on that on how they'll actually. We, I've we do a whole class like- on that, how to, how to approach clients, what to say to clients, uh, how to, uh, how to uh, win them over and land your first clients. So all my friends who are like, okay, great. This is exciting. I'm going to have the skills. I'm going to have how to do this stuff, but will I actually be able to get clients? The answer is yes. <laughs> Steve will show you what I love about this is again, when you're a writer, you're in the sales environment, right? Like you're, when you're trying to get clients, you're doing this thing, this in sales enablement, you're enabling yourself to get these clients. And I loved your example about when you do it properly, you're actually demonstrating your ability to be a sales enablement copywriter just by the copy that you send to potential clients. Well, that's it. That's it. Super exciting. And this is also guys, this is, there will be information on the certification. If this is something you're interested in, Um, But this is a cool one because they always come with samples and assignments, but because these are typically package deals of lots of projects, Steve is actually going to teach you how to write a variety of projects in this program. It's not like you're just learning battle cards or you're just learning one sheets or you're just learning emails. Not only is it just email, Steve, it's lots of kinds of emails, right? It's, it's different. When we say email, it's all around the baseball diamond and showing how to write all those kinds of emails. That's right? right. Absolutely right. That's huge. And I won't be just showing you examples of, of emails and battle cards of one sheets. And I won't be just teaching you how to write them. You will be writing them in the certification program yourself. I mean, so part of the certification away. program is to build up your own writing examples that you can show clients. So you will, by the time the certification finishes, you will have a portfolio that shows the full cohesive campaign that you can do all the sales and implement pieces. You'll have comfort actually going to clients and that confidence of, Okay, I've got the project. Now what happens? You'll know how to work through the project and even how to get the clients to have those opportunities. That's all part of the certification. Plus, you'll be certified. You'll have that extra piece of proof if you pass that there's written work, there's a a test at the end. Should you choose to be certified? Even if you don't, you still have the portfolio. You still have all the experience. But if you want to, you will have a chance to be certified, to have that badge saying, I'm one of the first certified sales enablement copywriters in the industry, which is such a freaking cool thing. I'm not so, even certified. <laughs> what? What'd you say? I, I'm not even certified. But you will be at the end. Of it. We're going to put you through the test. <laughs> oh, do I? If I take the test? Okay, good. <laughs> yes, I love it. All right, Pam Foster. So welcome to our stage. What uh, questions do we have from the audience? We have oodles of questions. They've been firing in the whole time. Um, uh, Steve, if, I'm going to start with the basics again, because I think some people, every, things were flying by so quickly. Like, what is the definition of a battle card again, please? A battle card is a, is a collection of copy lines that a salesperson can use in a variety of situations. And the example I gave earlier is, uh, let's say a prospect says, uh, hey, your competitor, your competitor's forklift truck is cheaper. Why should I buy yours? Well, there'll be an answer to a reply to that written out on the battle card that the salesperson can either just recite from exactly as written because you wrote it so brilliantly or uh, use it in an email and adapt it that way. And there's a, so there's a whole bunch of other copy lines. They're just copy lines. Okay, beautiful. Um, now, someone is saying, is a battle card for a rep when they're on the phone and a one sheet of the leave behind? Or are they both being used by the rep in a variety of ways? Yeah, I can see that. That, that, that could be confusing. Battle yeah. cards are only used by the salesperson. Uh, the salesperson never gives out the battle card. Okay, it's okay. only used by the salesperson. It's a tool for the salesperson to keep it on their desk. They refer to it. Okay. A one sheet is something published that they can use to send to a prospect as a leave behind after a presentation. Uh, they use it as, as, a, as a tool to give the prospect more information. Okay, perfect. Hopefully that's clear to everybody. Um, here's an interesting question. 
uh, I think I know the answer, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Is the copywriter going to replace the salesperson? Does the copy sell by itself or is the sales team always still mandatory for this? Yeah, I think it's this, uh, you're writing for a, a sales team that needs to exist. So you're not going in and, and writing a, a sales email that replaces the salesperson. Remember, they adapt the email to uh, their particular prospect that they're targeting one on one. Right. So you're you're there to to help the sales team, uh, you know, write copy, write content is going to help them sell more. OK, um, when you talk about companies, uh, one of our listeners asked at what employment levels or business sizes um, do small businesses use this? And then a, a follow up is where do you find the companies? Yeah, uh, small micro businesses, not so much. The business has to be large enough to have a sales team of at least three people. Once they have a sales team of at least three people, probably have over a million dollars in sales, they're a small company, then they become very interested in sales enablement. And then, of course, it just goes up from there, large, humongous companies. I was just speaking with a, um, a, a potential new client yesterday, and they're an international organization, and they have sales teams all over the world. So, there, she, she was uh, talking to me about you can help our sales team in the in the U.S. Pacific, and then in, did, we have a German sales team. You, they do English stuff. You can help. The, she's going on and on about all the different things that she needs. But uh, they have an international sales force. Okay, um, shouldn't we? And they put in quotes attacking the companies at multiple levels. To get your foot in the door, the CEO, sales and marketing VP, sales manager, is there a, a typical role that you recommend reaching out to? Yeah, here's, uh, there's no one person. Here's how it, it, it tends to break up in my experience. About 40% of sales enablement projects are going to be uh, quarterbacked by the, uh, the head salesperson, the sales leader, the sales director, the sales VP. They're the person that's going to hire you about 40% of the time. The other 40% of the time is going to be the senior marketing person, the marketing director, the marketing VP, because they get asked by sales, can you create some stuff for us? Do you know a copywriter that can help us? And the marketing department still kind of takes over the sales enablement stuff. That's another 40%. And that's a big opportunity for you because uh, if you go to marketing directors and say, hey, I know how to write this sales enablement stuff that's so strange to marketers, I mean, you're going you're to be a solution to them. And the other 20% of the time, it's the CEO, uh, you know, the owner of the company. Okay. All right. Now, this is an interesting question. If you're a writer for a particular client, what's the potential for working for both the marketing team side and then the sales team side? Or is that a conflict? It's not a conflict. It's, it's pretty high. Um, keep in mind that there's always this, uh, there's this traditional uneasiness mm -hmm. between marketing and sales. That's always been around in every organization. I don't think it's ever going to go away. But I don't think that impacts it at all. I mean, if marketing sees that, that the sales department has this great copywriter who can write this great stuff, you know, you, you, may, you may get a call. You know, in okay. fact, you should target marketing as well. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of companies that I've, I've done this work, you guys, in my corporate life for 25 years, um, there's a marketing communications department, and they handle a lot of the outbound marketing, web pages, retention newsletters, all that stuff, but they're not necessarily supporting the sales enablement part. That's over on the sales side. So you could get your foot in the door with a marketing communications department, and then they can introduce you to the sales side because it's all one big goal to get more business. That's right. That's right. And and also, you know, marketing sometimes doesn't understand how to write sales enablement stuff. So you can really right. potentially be a good resource for them to say, hey, I know how to write this sales enablement stuff, something mm -hmm. that marketing doesn't traditionally know how to write. I know the best practices. I know the formulas. I know what works. Nice. And you can be a real resource for marketing when they get asked to write the sales enablement stuff. Great. Okay. Um, somebody's saying, can you please provide a list of all the kinds of projects we'll learn with you? Well, generally how to write sales enablement materials, generally how to work with the sales team, how to understand the, uh, the sales process. But when it comes down to specifics, you're going to be learning how to write 
emails of all kind, cold outreach emails, follow-up emails. You can be learning how to write battle cards. And battle cards have a lot of different components to them. So you learn how to write all those different components, how to write the elevator pitch description of the product, how to write responses to competitor objections, things of that nature, all the different battle, star, battle card uh, components, call scripts, sales decks, one sheets, proposals. Yeah. So the full gambit, the full range of traditional sales enablement materials, you'll be learning how to write. Okay. And someone said they didn't quite get what a sales deck is. If you could explain that again. A sales deck is a PowerPoint presentation. It's a, it's a series of slides. But what a salesperson does is they pull slides from that sales deck, from that sales presentation to adapt it to make a customized presentation to a prospect. So a sales deck can have sometimes, I've written some 50, 60, 70 slides. Now a salesperson doesn't use all those slides. They'll pick and choose what slides are going to be best for that particular prospect's presentation. Okay. And, oh, go ahead, Rebecca. I have a couple of things just real quick to fire off. Uh, people who are asking about questions about the actual certification cost and things like that, uh, we will put a link in the chat. Ben, if you can go ahead and pop the uh, detail slide up that has the link in it. But my circle of success friends, remember that you have a different discount. So it's on your member page. If you have any questions, reach out to the guidance team or the member success team. But that link has all the information on the certification. We'll have more coming. It's kind of brand new. Those of you who are asking questions about the details, we didn't want to spend the majority of the time. We wanted you to learn about sales and implement today so you can learn more at that. And we'll send you more information about the certification in the coming days. Today's session was really intended to make sure that you understand this opportunity and get all your questions asked. But by all means, learn about the certification. If you're looking to do this, this is the time. Get in on the ground floor. Steve is the best teacher on the topic. Really one of our best teachers, period. Um, you'll enjoy the program. You'll have confidence. You'll work on six different assignments. You'll have a portfolio. You can sit for the certification if you decide. You'll understand how to intake and how to work on the projects, and you'll learn how to get clients. So it really is an all-encompassing business in a box, if you will. If you're looking to launch, you can do this. Or if you're like Steve and you've been doing this for a while and you're just looking for something different, this can be a new opportunity. You're zooming into another opportunity in the big, gigantic, growing world of copywriting. So information on the certification is there. And there was one other question I wanted you to ask. Well, before we go on, could I add something to that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as anybody's taken a course from me knows, I mean, during, during the program, the sales and Enablement program, you know, I'm very accessible. When you have questions, you want to send me a private email, you need help, I, I'm there to help you. I, I lean in, okay, <laughs> to help you in any way possible. So you can find me very accessible, very, very easy to contact, and I and I, I will I will work with you throughout the program. I love that. That and I 100 I agree. And even Pam has been behind the scenes on a lot of these programs and knows that Steve doesn't just show up and teach. He's in the boat with you for five weeks, making sure that everybody who leaves, who gets to the other side is armed and prepared and confident to do the job and land those clients. This was an interesting comment, uh, question for me. Doug is saying, does this include product or, or projects for individual products in a company's product line? So if a sales team sells more than one type of project or product, mm -hmm. could you be asked to write a full gamut of stuff for another product? Yeah, I'm so, I'm so glad that you, you asked that question. Uh, because you're absolutely correct. That's exactly what happens. If a company has six core products, you could be writing sales enablement materials for each of the six core yes. products. You know, uh, there's a company I've been working with for many, many years, and they have uh, four major programs. Uh, they market to real estate uh, people. And I had to write sales enablement materials separately so they're like for, for each one of those programs. A lot of stuff. <laughs> I love that. I hadn't even of thought of that, Doug. So thank you for bringing that question. So my $5,000 package over on this project product could be on that product and then this product and then this product. So I'm going after sales teams that have multiple things to sell. <laughs> you know, I used to work for a veterinary diagnostic equipment company and they had several product lines plus a software line plus, a, you know, medications they were developing. And it was ongoing. So once you're in, it's just amazing how you can just grow and expand with a client because they don't want to change writers. Once you're in, they're like, oh, phew, we found a great person. Let's go. So that's kind of exciting. Um, okay. 
I have a few more questions. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to keep answering while you're asking and uh, okay. queuing up a on there. Real basic one. What do you use to make all these templates? Do you write them in Word and, and pre uh, present them to the client and then they have a designer make them groovy or what? how does that work? What the client wants from you is the copy. That's all they want. So you can submit. Your deliverable is a Word document. That's Even your deliverable. Even for PowerPoint? Pardon me? Even for the slide deck? Uh, well, the slide decks, yeah, the same thing. So I do write the slides in PowerPoint, and in the course, I'll show you how how that looks, okay? But then they they send those slides to a designer to kind of dress them up, make okay. them look good. All right. So you don't have to worry about the uh, you know the, the the specific design stuff. You can just use kind of a template approach to write the slides, and then they'll they'll have a designer take care of it. Yep. Teresa Thanks. wants to know, as far as the certification goes, what other pre-training might need to be accomplished? Ideally, if you have any form of prior training, so if you've been through the 80 by method, if you've been through Steve's B2B course, that will put you ahead. But Steve did help us put together a primer for this program. So if for some reason you're coming into this somewhat new, there is a primer on writing B2B copy. That's part of it. If you already have the background, you've been through the 80 by method or Steve's program, you can bypass the primer and show up for the first day of class. If you have not, sign up now for the certification and spend next week going through the primer so that you're coming in with that foundation in place. But we did build that into the program because I knew the minute, actually someone in member success asked this question because we knew the minute we went through this, we're like, people are, we're going to want, we want this. <laughs> so how can I get into this if this is something that really excites me? So hopefully that, that helps you, Teresa. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we have a few questions about um, talking with the client. Uh, so the first one is, how do you convince a client that you can do sales enablement copywriting if you've never done it before? Can you write a pretend piece and send it? Well, that's one of the advantages of sales enablement, right? In marketing, they like, you, they like to see a portfolio of client work, right? But in sales enablement materials, understandably, your clients don't want you to show other companies their sales enablement stuff. Ah. They don't want you to write a battle card and then post it on the internet and show everybody oh. their battle card. It's like inside competitive stuff. It's like a game, yeah. Right, right. So uh, in sales enablement, it's perfectly acceptable to show a client a practice piece. Here's an example of how I would write a battle card based on a fictional company. Here's how I would approach it. Here's what the copy would look like. Same thing with an email. Okay, or or a sales deck. And you can show them this stuff. They can look at it and go, yeah, you know exactly what you're doing. And they can make their judgment from there. So yeah. uh, you do have, it's, it's, it's a nice advantage to have in sales enablement. This, the expectation of, of uh, from a client of being shown a, a big fancy portfolio really doesn't exist in sales enablement. No, and clients wouldn't want you to, you know. They would no, just, clients don't want you to share. Yeah, clients don't want you to share their... Uh, you know, sales email templates and battle cards and one sheets. No, maybe the one sheets, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, okay. So how do you negotiate your time frame for completing a package? Um, you know, Steve, you're very experienced, but if someone's newer, it might take longer. Does the company set the parameters or do you set up a production schedule? It's the... better if you do it. And for your first project, give yourself a lot of time. You know how it, how it works. I, I said that you can write a battle card in a day. Well, you know, your first battle card is going to take you four times longer. The second one will take you two days. The third one will take you a day. That's just the way things work, right? The first time you do something. So give yourself lots of time. I found with uh, with clients, it's not really a big deal to uh, set your own deadline, to tell the client, okay, I'll, I can deliver the battle card in two weeks. Give yourself some elbow room, some time to write it. Um, and that's usually perfectly fine. There usually isn't kind of a frantic deadline. It's not like, oh, we need this by tomorrow at noon because we're launching our online campaign. You don't really get that so much in sales enablement. Okay. Um, we have a few questions related to the contract um, or how you do get engaged to do this. Would it be a retainer situation or a package bundle uh, set up or for small companies, I always recommend you get a 50% deposit for large, like for IBM, for a large company that becomes a little more difficult, but you make sure you get listed as, as a, as an approved vendor. And then your invoices will be paid. No problem. 
Okay. And they'll, and they'll tell you how to, how to be listed as their approved vendor. There's usually an intake of some kind with large, humongous companies. So typically from my work with, with B2B companies, um, they don't necessarily put you on retainer, but they have you on a monthly invoicing role, like you just said. So you keep track of the, the projects you're working on each month, the, the fees everybody agreed to, and then you invoice every month and you get paid within 30 days and you're on a roll like that. Is that pretty Yeah, much Yeah, this is more of a project-based kind of business. <clears throat> so you, you quote maybe a package of materials, you do it, you get paid, and then they'll come back to you and say, okay, we need more emails. That usually is the second, that's usually what happens afterwards. We need more emails, Steve. <laughs> We're, we're launching this new product. We need some more materials here. And it kind of unfolds like that. Okay. Um, here's an interesting question. What percentage increase in sales have you typically witnessed after doing these materials for the company? And my quick answer is you can create great materials. You can't always control how well the salesperson uses them. You can't control that. But, I mean, you can help them do better. Have you seen specific numbers like that? or? Yeah, uh, and you always have to be careful of making any sort of promises and guarantees because, like you said, Pam, there's so many other factors at play. The quality of the product, how competitive their marketplace is, how good their sales team is. Your your sales email template that you write for them is just one tool in, in that puzzle. However, <laughs> however, I've been very confident in in telling clients that I can improve their cold prospecting emails, their reply rates, response rates, by 10% more than what they're doing now. And 10% is huge because 10% more people into the, into the, into the baseball diamond, into the, uh, into the sales pipeline means more sales at the end. Sales, sales directors get that math instantly, right? So uh, I'm pretty confident to say that. Now, I've been doing it for a while, so I wouldn't recommend you say it at first. Get, 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 get good at it first. Uh, get comfortable at the results you're getting. And then you can start confidently saying, yeah, I think I can do this for you. Well, the other wonderful sort of math or ROI thing I try to come up with return on investment is you're going to spend, you know, $10,000 on me doing some packages for you. What would one additional sale mean to you? Like if it's software and a company is going to completely overhaul their software system for $300,000 and they get one more sale from my little project, it's paid for itself, you know. So much more. So that's yeah. kind of how I look at it too. Yeah, that's why the fee resistance in sales enablement, copywriting is so low. Because yeah. sales directors can do the math, like I said, very quickly. If you if you say, you know, you can write in a package of sales emails for three thousand dollars, that's gonna help them uh, get more prospects in the sales funnel, help their salespeople move prospects towards the sale, get more sales at the end. To them, it's really it's a no brainer. It's instant. It's like, yeah, let's do this. Cool. Okay. Marketing um, side is a little more complicated. On the marketing side, it's more, well, let's see if we can get this in the budget and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking to sales directors, it's like, let's do it now. All right. It's a little brainer to them. Trying to see if there are any other questions that aren't specific to, um, let's see. If I've given a whole, if I'm given a whole package from the sales director, how do I avoid sounding repetitious in the different types of projects I write for them? That's a good one. Well, just because something is is formulaic doesn't mean it, it sounds the same with every application. For each product, for each situation, for each company, there's going to be lots and lots of differences that you're working with. But the formulas, the writing formulas that you use is, is the same. There's a lot of formulaic stuff in sales enablement. Um, to give you an example of, of another project you might be familiar with, case studies, success stories, which, by the way, is a sales enablement piece that, that you write. Um, uh, that tends to be very formulaic in how it's written, but every success story sounds like a different story. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, here's another question from Patrick. I worked as a business development manager for over a decade, and I regularly interfaced with our sales team. I wrote collateral material for trade shows and the sales team. How is this different, or is it pretty much the same? Yeah, and, and with your background, you could do very well in sales enablement. Um, what's, you know, sales enablement has been around for decades. I mean, people, uh, uh, you know, salespeople needed, uh, call scripts and battle cards. Battle cards go back to the eighties. What's happened in recent years is that the use of sales enablement content has just exploded. 
companies have have started to have been beginning to invest heavily in sales enablement. It's a $66 billion industry in North America right now, the, the wider sales enablement uh, universe. So it's just grown by leaps and bounds. So yes, it's always been around. A few years ago, someone coined the term sales enablement and it's stuck. <laughs> so we're using that term now. And, um, and that's where it is. It's funny. That's what happened to content marketing. We were writing content for, you know, ever. And so oh, yeah. someone came up with content marketing as the new phrase, but it's like, that's not new. Anyway, um, <laughs> do prospects know the different pieces, the battle cards, et cetera, or do we need to educate them on those components? No, they know the different pieces. They know exactly what a battle card is. They know exactly what a sales deck is, a uh, prospecting email, or sometimes they call them cold emails. They know what that is. Okay. So you don't have to educate them or sell them on the concept of this stuff. They, they know what these things are. They're looking to get these things written. Okay. Here's a great question. I love this one. How often do you do the sales enablement content for the same product? Is it once and done, or do you update it frequently? Um, when I got into this, I thought it was going to be once and done. I thought, okay, I'll write a package of sales enablement materials for a sales team for a company, and then they're not going to need me anymore. What surprised me is that I constantly get calls to uh, for new selling situations to update the sales emails. Steve, can you come in and, and look through our sales emails now? Where can we improve them? Because uh, you know companies are always looking for ways to sell more. They're always tweaking. Right, they're always launching new products that need sales enablement materials. They're always making changes to products. Uh, they're always generating leads in new ways, and those leads need to be responded to with different emails and materials. So it's ongoing. Okay, um, can you? I know, I, Rebecca, help me with this one. Um, we didn't want to get into the weeds on the course, but some people are asking, like, if I can't take every live session, yeah, for sure. it's going to be recorded, and how will that unfold schedule-wise and things like that? I just meant we didn't want to take up too much time in the course, okay. in this training today. I want to see if you have the whole hour to be able to share it, because it's just okay. so eye-opening, and he gave so many, so many great tips of things that apply just as being a writer and a professional in addition to this. But we can ask any questions we want about the cert. So sorry, it will be recorded. It starts the week before boot camp. So those of you who are going to boot camp, we are going to break during the week of boot camp, the first that first boot camp. So you'll start the program. We'll give you assignments. You'll actually write that week during boot camp. You'll have time to kind of process, catch up. Everything will be recorded all the way through. So if something happens in life where you can't make the live sessions, you will have the recordings. We post them same day. Steve, like he said, is available that whole period. So it's not like, ah, if I miss the call on Tuesday, then what do I do? You have a private Facebook group just with this class. So the classmates can answer. The we have a teaching assistant who's in there who was just in the live. And then Steve is present there as well. So you can ask questions, get your answers. For me, I'm, a, I'm a, a listener when I'm in a class anyways. I'm not a proactive. I want to just consume and absorb what he's teaching. I want to take my notes and I want to think. And then I like to ask questions afterwards. So for me, that's the perfect setup anyways. So whatever your life is working like right now, it will work for you. We will take the break over boot camp. So it's, it's technically eight sessions, twice a week over four weeks, but we take a break for boot camp. So it's a five-week training program. But I love that because it gives you that extra week to kind of get to stay up to speed and have some writing time so that that first date is like the week of october 5th just making sure excellent no i'm asking <laughs> i hope everybody knows oh, that I'm sure. I, I i'm shocked that we haven't put up the dates yet i will find all the dates i didn't realize they didn't have them already in the chat oh, sorry. i'll get, all, I, I, I'll get I, all that for you guys thank no you worries. um well because we have people asking but also yeah, let's for sure see. Steve, can you give an example of how to answer an executive about the price being too high? Do you run into that objection? Well, I don't run into the objection when I quote them a price, but it's some, it's part of a battle card, right? You you write a battle card. So usually when you write an objection, uh, when, you write for, when you're writing for a sales team and you're writing that battle card section, your price is too high. Uh, there's a I don't want to get into it too deeply. You have yeah. to decide which type of objection it is. Is it an accurate objection? It could be a misunderstanding, a common misunderstanding. Maybe the price isn't more expensive. Maybe there's some extras you have. So you got to find out what kind of objection there is. And then there's a formula to follow to write that objection. Okay. I, I can't, I, it'll take me 20 minutes to get into the different parts of it, but there's a, for, a writing formula to follow that answers that objection beautifully. Okay. 
Could a person who still has a job at this point fit this type of writing into their 40 hour work week? Good uh, when I started in copywriting, I'm going to age myself here back in the 90s. I, w- I was full time in sales, <laughs> coincidentally, full time in sales for three years, building my business part time. So it's doable. Moonlighting is doable. Uh, is it challenging? Yeah. You know, but it's also exciting. You know, when, when you when you start getting more clients, and work starts to starts to uh, to your income starts to, to improve. Um, it's, it's exciting. And then you get to a point where you have to make that decision. Should I quit my day job and do this full time? That's kind of a nice decision to have to make. Right. So yeah, it's um, doable. I did it. Most, most copywriters have done it. Right. Um, Emerson is asking, although this is new, what is your vision for this niche in terms of growth? And again, I don't feel like it's new, but it's being discussed in a new way. Um, so I think it's going to be ongoing till the end of time until they don't have sales calls anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, this isn't like, uh, remember remember the social media platform Periscope? Anybody remember that one? Yeah. Yes. Anybody, is, is it around anymore? I used a huge deal and for like a, a bleep, you know, yeah. like a year and then it was done. It's not, that's not sales enablement. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Why? Because the better tools you give a sales team, the better they're able to sell. They're, they sell more. Every company knows this. They're getting on top of this. And uh, there's no reason for them to not do it. I mean, they're just going to invest more and more into it. So it's been around for a long time. It's growing rapidly now. And it's just going to continue to grow. Cool. Um, let's see now. Let me see. I'm trying to find questions for you, Steve. Some of these are questions about specific programs we offer and can they take this at the same time and things like that. But uh, the let- primer, so Michelle's asking if the primer is an additional cost, it's included in the certification. So it will be on your member page when you sign up. So if you sign up today, you can literally start going through the primer before you even get to the actual program a week from now. Yeah, and that's a good first step for everybody who signs up for the program is that if 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 you feel that your your copywriting skills and knowledge isn't at at, at, a, at a comfort level, go through that primer right away. I mean, uh, download it today and go through it today. Okay. All righty. Um, Bobby's asking, how would you protect your samples from being pilfered by a company? Whoops, it just went away. Um, prior to them actually making a commitment to work with you. Well, you show them a couple of examples, just mock examples. And yeah, I suppose they could kind of reverse engineer your sample email and, and if, but it doesn't, that doesn't happen. It I just doesn't happen. Say that. No, because they want you to write it for their company and their needs. And yeah. they don't know how to do it. Otherwise they would have already. <laughs> so this, your value is bringing that skill set to their specific needs. That's right. So um, let's see, as a new copywriter, is this something I shouldn't jump into? Um, if I, uh, I, I can't really answer that for you, but yeah. I can tell you what I would do. If, if sales enablement was as big as it is today when I started in the 90s, I would have started with sales enablement. Um, and having I'm, been in the industry for over 20 years, I'm thinking of jumping to sales. I'm just kidding. I will stay with you guys, Aiden, because I love you so much and I love what I do. But if I was going to do something, <laughs> this is what I would do. This is my jam. I love that it's not complex as far as, again, big ideas and controls and sales copy. And, and I love that side of the business too. I, I do get a kick out of strategy and, and coming up with ideas. But I love if I was starting, I would start on a project that is formulaic, that is that there is a definitive way to do it, because I think that that's easier to grasp and learn and step into. You can feel confident I delivered what you asked me to do easier than something that is bigger in concept and ideas. And there, there's a, an excitement and energy to sales. That yeah. is is nice to be connected to. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're great people. Uh, sales directors, sales teams are just really fun, interesting people who uh, want to accomplish something. And they're kind of like you. I mean, you're a you're a freelance writer, freelance copywriter, or you want to be. You know, you want to you want to kind of steer your own ship and 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 build your own career. They're kind of like that. They're autonomous kind of people. They're they're entrepreneurial in nature, even though they work for a company. 
um, and they're trying to carve out their own future. So they're, they're kind of like you. <laughs> and it's uh, they're fun people to work with. That's sales, sales reps by nature, right? That's why sales reps end up being sales reps is because they're charismatic and they like talking right. to people and they're part of that. So I could see why it'd be fun to work with them. And you're right. The closer you are, we didn't even talk about this though, but the closer you are to the sale, I know I have a lot of writer friends who like to stay up at the content side of persuasion or persuasion and, and informing and awareness. This kind of gives you the chance to do what feels good on the content side, but still be connected to the sale, which is the fun part of the entire marketing process. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's also you're valuable. I mean, you can yes. you can see how your work is helping them generate sales. Uh, so it, it it makes you seem much more valuable to your client. They see you much more as a, as a linchpin to their operations. And uh, I think that's a nice place to be in. As a I love that. It's another good dot connection. If you were drawn to content and what in your mind, the the what draws you to content is the typically the I'm not asking for the sale. I'm providing information and awareness. It's like you get to have those benefits, but be at the end of the line where the sales are, which was Steve said, makes you the most valuable writer because you are right there helping sales cross the line. You are directly influencing the bottom line of a business, which is a great place to be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here's a cool question. And I, I, I kind of feel like this might be baked in, but um, it's, is there a consultant or audit type service where a company would hire you to review existing assets and make recommendations on which ones should be revamped? Uh, yeah, there, there's a, a service I offer that's, that companies take advantage of. I call, I call it copy consulting. I'm not the only copywriter who does that. But what will happen is I'll get on a Zoom call with a client for a couple of hours. They'll show me their sales emails. And I'll go over them and give them recommendations for improvement and things like that. You can offer that service yourself. And that can be quite lucrative. Sometimes what happens at the end of the cons consultation, they end up hiring you to write the stuff anyway. So... <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Uh, would white papers fall into the sales enablement world? There's some projects that are crossover, right? Because sales teams use white papers in the sales process. In that evaluation stage, second base, they'll often send a client a, a white paper if they're selling a technology, for example. So uh, you could be hired to write the, the white paper. You could be hired to write case studies and customer success stories. You mentioned blogs earlier. You could be hired to write articles that the sales team uses as, as a, a piece of content that they can send to, to prospects to kind of keep them interested, right? So there's some crossover materials between sales and marketing that you could be writing as well. Okay. Um, would this be a good thing? I, I don't know if anyone answered the car question before. In the car world, but also real estate. We've got someone actually who's in real estate who already answered the question saying, yes, I've been doing this for a long time. Oh. This is where it's at. She says she's, she does sales and implement in her real estate market for over 20 years. And she's like, this is a huge thing, especially for the higher end sales. Again, it, it all comes down to some of you are asking about the kinds of companies Steve was talking about. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. It's if there's a long sales cycle, if it's a product that requires lots of touches to get someone to close. So while it might not be a car dealership per se that's selling a Honda, it's the longer, but if I'm selling corporate cars to a company or luxury car, maybe higher end where there might be multiple touches, that might be an example of something that requires more. Yeah, but if you're selling corporate sales. Corporate sales. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, Starbucks has a corporate sales department. And because I bought a bunch of corporate, uh, like a bunch of Starbucks cards through their corporate, corporate sales division last year for some clients, uh, uh, I, I get their sales emails and that. So I think a sales rep that's contacted me and nurturing me, hoping that I'll, I'll buy again this fall, right? So, uh, and I see a lot of the techniques they're using and things of that nature. So even like Starbucks has a B2B division with a sales team. Okay. Um, I thought you'd like to know that Ruth, who is, hi, Ruth. She's always with us on these things. She said, Indeed.com is advertising for sales enablement specialists. Being able to put certified in that title should have companies courting us. Absolutely. You're right. Good thinking. I love that, Ruth. Yeah. Let's do it. We're at three minutes to two, uh, 1.30. So we're going to do a last call for questions. We have to let Steve get back to actually doing 
<laughs> doing the work as well. Steve, this has been such a great webinar. I'm so glad that you mentioned this idea to me at the beginning of the summer and that we're able to bring it to the 85 members because, and I love that you jumped all the way in with us to bring the certification. This is like we talked about earlier. This is ground floor. Those of you who know you want this, who want to run, let's run. Let's get you up and going and taking over the industry, like Ruth said, as certified sales and event copywriters. We'll have this kind of, this is not going to be something that's a one and done. We're not going to have this conversation today and never have it again. It's going to continue, but we want to get those of you who want to do this, who want in now to get in now. So you'll sign up for the certification. It's going to start in a week. We'll take the week off for boot camp, but we don't want to wait. We're going to get you up, get you out and going because there's still time in this year to actually do something with this, which is why I love the timing. So Steve, thank you for today. And also just pushing to get the certification up with us and then blocking off five weeks of your time. I mean, that is, thank you. <laughs> I really oh, appreciate my, my it. My pleasure. Mm-hmm. All, All right. right. Well, so we just have a few questions left. Um, where do you find the companies that do this? Um, are you going to go through that in your program? I'm going to go through it in the program. I mean, but they're not hard to find. A Google search will give you a bunch of companies. They're not, it's not difficult to find. Any company with a, uh, a longer sales process, um, usually B2B or insurance or real estate, something like that, and that has a sales team. Okay. Not, not difficult well, to find. Olga's asking, once you write the pieces to sell the client's products is that all there is what are the chances of being an ongoing provider we've sort of answered that that you'll be yeah i sort of answered that and understand the 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 question because i had the same question when i got into it and yeah there's it's it's ongoing it's ongoing work all right short and easy okay finally jeff asks you mentioned showing a practice assignment to your own prospects do you use company names as testimonials on your own site uh, I do have a couple from sales enablement projects that are testimonials, but I don't show samples for the reason that they're confidential. In yeah. fact, it's not, it's not, com- it's not, un- uh, it's common for companies to ask you to, to sign an NDA, you know, before you write this stuff. They don't want you to share the inside sales tools with potentially their competitors. Right. Okay. So, uh, it's, that's why it's perfectly okay to show a, a mock example. Mm-hmm. Of, of a battle card or a, or a script or a call script or something like that to potential prospects. And they'll understand r- instantly why you're doing that. It's Which is great. Okay. That's actually something we do in the certification. It is a mock, the whole thing. It's a fictitious company so that what you write, you can share. And like Steve said, I hadn't even thought of this. When you go to a potential client, you have something to show them that's not from another company because that would seem in that moment there would be a little bit of a, hmm, this seems a little bit unethical to be showing me my competitor's stuff. It's almost like they would expect you to have a sample rather than a real, something that you've done for another client. That's absolutely right. That's what I do. I, I, I show 10 samples. I love it. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here today. If you have any other questions, I'll make sure to connect with everybody. I'll get you the playback and kind of my takeaway notes. If you have any other questions for me or for Steve, you'll be able to, to get them to me. And I'll get you the answers. But again, Steve, thank you so much for being here today. This was great. And Pam, thank you for handling the Q&A as well. Happy to, happy to. All right, everyone. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Thanks a lot, everyone.